anti-vaxxers still never come up with anything new. Whenever something they try fails, they just recycle it and try it again. And that's the case with this DNA contamination in mRNA vaccine nonsense. Hey, I'm Dr. Wilson, I'm a PhD molecular biologist, and welcome to another COVID debunking video. So a few months ago I made this video debunking an incredibly sloppy preprint where I showed that the methods were so sloppy that the results were absolutely useless, but if I took the results at face value, they don't support what the author was claiming in the slightest. Now there's another preprint by the same author claiming the same thing, that there's DNA contamination in COVID mRNA vaccines that are far above the allowable FDA limits. And it's just as wrong and sloppy as the first one. But a lot of you have been asking me to debunk it, so here we go. I will tell you exactly how this paper is so sloppy that it is practically useless, again, and I will tell you everything you need to know to understand why this story is wrong to begin with. Just for those who don't know, this is a preprint. That means it has not been peer-reviewed, but that's not why it's wrong. So let's get into what makes it wrong. Before we get to the data, I'm just going to jump the gun a little bit and tell you why this whole idea was wrong to begin with. Every single biologic or drug that uses biological materials in the manufacturing process needs to go through certain quality control standards in order to get FDA approval, and each subsequent batch that goes out to the public also needs to pass those same quality control standards. This is a whole regulatory area called good manufacturing practice, and it is global. Flashing across your screen right now are just some of the tests that each and every COVID mRNA vaccine batch had to pass before it went out to the public. This includes quantifying residual DNA left by the plasmid that is used in the manufacturing process to make the mRNA. These tests are done both by the manufacturers and also by third parties, which are called contract research organizations. The results are then reviewed by regulatory bodies before the lots can go out to the public. Each test is qualified and validated and uses qualified and validated reagents. The qualification of the assay itself and the reagents takes significant effort to demonstrate that they are actually measuring what the test is designed to measure and that it can demonstrate purity or contamination or lack thereof in whatever the context may be. The point is there is a lot of work that goes into this, a lot of people do these tests, and a lot of regulatory bodies all over the world look at the results. So if these results are going to be overturned, then you need something of equal rigor to overturn them. And these preprints are nowhere near that level of rigor. I'm not sure they even qualify as being of the quality of like an undergraduate project, to be honest. Anyway, let's now look at the preprints and what they show, or what they claim to show. In this new preprint, again, what they're looking at are what they claim to be COVID mRNA vaccine vials, and they are testing the liquid inside of them for residual DNA contamination. They're doing this by using qPCR, which is the gold standard by which DNA and other nucleic acids are quantified in this context. But like the first preprint, there are still significant issues. If you haven't watched my previous video on this topic, I highly recommend you go check that out because I explain it all in much more detail. But in their first preprint, their qPCR reaction failed efficiency, which off the bat means it is totally invalid. And by the way, anybody who publishes a qPCR reaction or tries to publish one that failed efficiency is doing incredibly sloppy work. I can't stress that enough. It's a huge mistake that an undergraduate shouldn't make, let alone someone trying to publish a preprint that is trying to take down all of the pharmaceutical and regulatory industries. In any case, in this new preprint, their efficiency looks much better. Very glad they learned that part. However, just like the first preprint, they are miscalculating the amount of DNA in their sample, and as a result, hugely overestimating how much DNA is there. Funnily enough, this overestimation still puts them below the FDA regulatory limit. Yeah, they admit and fully show that their measurements were below the FDA regulatory limit. Anyway, the correct way to calculate how much DNA you have in your samples in this context is to use qPCR to get a copy number. Once you have a copy number of how many copies of DNA you have in your sample, you can then use that copy number to calculate a gram amount. But remember, as I explained in my previous video, any trace amounts of DNA that are going to be in the COVID mRNA vaccines are going to be in fragments. That's because the plasmid used for manufacturing is digested by enzymes called DNases, and then most of those fragments are removed away from the mRNA before it's made into the drug product. Because you have the copy number as determined by qPCR, you then have to determine what the average length of the fragments are in your sample. 
That can be done using something called an electropharogram. And once you have the average base pair length, you can use that length to calculate a gram amount of DNA. This is a kind of method that would be standard in industry and adhere to GMP regulations. This author, they didn't do that. They simply took the copy number that they got from qPCR and assumed that it corresponded to full length plasmid, which would be on the order of six or 7,000 base pairs, as opposed to the actual average fragment length, which would be about 200 base pairs. So you're off by an order of magnitude at least. And again, even without this big blunder of an overcalculation, they are still measuring DNA in levels that are lower than the regulatory limits. Well, so much for what he said in his previous preprint about the DNA being in levels orders of magnitude higher than the regulatory limits. Yes, he's going to admit he's wrong, right? No, of course not. These are anti-vaxxers. They never admit they're wrong. They just move on to the next claim. Or in this case, find some absolute nonsense to keep the same claim. In this new preprint, they have done something called a qubit analysis. For biologists listening who don't know what a qubit analysis is, you can think of it as a nanodrop spectrophotometer. It's only really useful for giving you ballpark estimations of how much DNA there is. The qubit works by adding dyes to the sample, which will what we call intercalate, or bind in between the grooves of the DNA or nucleic acids present in the sample. And then those fluorophores are going to light up. And at first glance, this might look all well and good. A qubit requires a standard curve of known amounts of DNA, so you can plot the fluorescence of your sample against the standard curve and get an idea of how much DNA there is. And in their case, when they do this, they say that they get levels that are way above the FDA limits. Wow. But there are two huge red flags here that would give anybody who knows what they're looking at pause. Number one, qPCR, like I said earlier, is the gold standard. Qubit is not going to give you a more accurate count of nucleic acid quantification than qPCR. And why the discrepancy? Why would qubit give a much bigger reading of DNA than qPCR? Well, it's in the details. Qubit analysis is good for measuring DNA even when RNA is present, but only if the amount of RNA is less or equimolar or equal to the amount of DNA in the sample. But these are COVID mRNA vaccines. We know that there is tons more mRNA than there are residual DNA fragments in these vaccines. And when you have that much extra mRNA, you better make sure it's not interfering with your measurement of DNA in this assay. And they didn't do that. In fact, it becomes even more obvious that this is exactly what's happening when we look at their comparison between Pfizer vaccines and Moderna vaccines. We know that Moderna vaccines have more mRNA than Pfizer vaccines. Moderna is a 100 microgram dose and Pfizer is a 30 microgram dose. And yet, even though by qPCR, the amount of DNA they measured in Moderna was less than that of Pfizer, when they did qubit, the amount of DNA that they supposedly measured was much greater in Moderna than in Pfizer. None of that adds up, but it's all perfectly explained by interference of mRNA in this fluorescence assay. Do sloppy work, get sloppy results, make sloppy conclusions. Those aren't all the issues with this preprint. There are many more, but I think you get the picture. This is incredibly sloppy work that does not come near the rigor that is required to overturn all of the work that has been done all around the world by manufacturers, regulators, and third parties to demonstrate that these vaccines do pass regulatory standards. But if you're still worried about this and you're thinking, what if, or what about those trace amounts in the vaccine? Are they harmful? I got you. In molecular biology, there is a long history of scientists working with DNA, trying to get DNA inside cells, trying to get cells to express that DNA, and tracking what happens to that DNA when it gets inside the cell. First of all, DNA, once it gets delivered to the cell, is going to be in the cytoplasm. DNA in the cytoplasm is something a cell really doesn't like. It's like a fire alarm going off. That's because DNA in the cytoplasm means either a virus is there, or DNA is leaking from the nucleus, and neither of those are good things which would usually result in the cell either killing itself or being attacked by the immune system. The DNA in the cytoplasm can be sensed by multiple different things, including DNases, things called toll-like receptors, or a pathway called C-gas sting. All of these mechanisms and more are what protects your cells from foreign DNA. Obviously, you don't want foreign DNA being taken up by your cells and incorporated willy-nilly into your genome. That's really bad for evolution. So your cells have evolved many ways to prevent that from happening. But finally, you might be wondering, 
are you sure? Do we know that it poses no risk? What do these regulations really mean? What are they based on? And do they apply to lipid nanoparticles, which are in mRNA vaccines? I got you. Remember how I said there is a long history of molecular biologists working with DNA, trying to get it into cells and seeing what happens? Well, part of that history deals with something called DNA vaccines. Yep, there's mRNA vaccines, and we also have DNA vaccines. DNA vaccines use DNA in the form of a plasmid, a circular piece of DNA. These circular pieces of DNA are encapsulated in lipid particles. That's how they get into the cell. And when these DNA vaccines were first made, there were concerns that the DNA could integrate into host genomes and cause things like cancer. So there were several studies done to ask this question of what happens? Is there a risk? And the answer is no. One such study used a DNA vaccine and tested it on mice. These mice were given very high levels of plasmid DNA, and it was found that despite the DNA hanging around in muscle cells for upwards of six months, no integration events could be detected. In fact, the authors calculated that the risk of integration with a plasmid DNA in a DNA vaccine context was less than the rate of spontaneous mutation. In other words, it was safer than the passage of time. And yes, there have been human studies too. There's even a COVID DNA vaccine that uses one to two milligrams of DNA as its dose. And there hasn't been observations of integration or increased cancers or anything like that with the DNA vaccine or any other DNA vaccine for that matter. So in summary, both this new preprint as well as the old one are incredibly sloppy, practically useless, and might as well just be blog posts. Not only are there huge efforts involving tens if not hundreds of thousands of people all over the world working to do tests on every single batch of COVID mRNA vaccine and every biologic to ensure that they pass regulatory standards, but the theoretical risk posed by these claimed amounts of DNA, even that's a stretch. At worst, you'll get decreased efficacy of your mRNA vaccine if there's too much DNA in it. That's the problem you'll run into before you start getting integration and cancer. But I think I've said enough for this video. What we have is not a serious scientific concern. What we have are anti-vaxxers fumbling around in the lab, publishing things, trying to stay relevant and keep you in fear. But I'll provide all the links to all of the science that I talked about in this video in the description below so that you don't have to be afraid of what they're saying. I know a lot of this might have seemed technical to some of you, but I want you to understand that it's very easy to debunk people like this. I just did it while sleep deprived. Shout out to my newborn son for that. Thanks, bud. Anyway, that's going to do it for this week's video. Thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. And don't forget to subscribe so you can catch me next week where I'll be debunking some more funky stuff. See you then. Mm -hmm.